Good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming. I'm Steve Goldman. I'm the director of the Center for Free Enterprise. And I'm really excited about today's event and also the one that we're going to have on November 4th. So on November 4th, we're bringing Bob Lawson and Ben Powell into town. They're going to talk about their book, Socialism Sucks, Two Economists Drink Their Way Through the Unfree World. And it's kind of like Anthony Bourdain meets Milton Friedman. And they're going to give you a tour guide and they're going to talk about the socialism they saw compared to countries right next door that weren't as socialistic. And their talk will be at 4.30 in the College of Business Auditorium, which you guys are used to going to. Little housekeeping. First, as always, if you're not an econ major, you should be an economics major. You guys know that, right? But you can also minor in economics. But the nice thing about economics, you can do a BA from the Arts and Sciences side, or a BS. If you're interested, you can talk to me or Professor Jay Vahaley, department chair down here, and talk about the major. Also, no matter what your major is, even if you're in music, you should get a minor in entrepreneurship. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is a great, a great minor, and if you want to do that, <laughs> Bobby Garrett is up there. He's the chair of the entrepreneurship department. Talk to him, and um, it's a probably a good thing to do. You received a survey on your, when you entered, and we would really like your input. Um, the, when you complete these surveys, that feedback is really useful for us in terms of our programming, so we'd really like that. And if you're getting extra credit, um, you must fill out the survey to get that extra credit. Make sure your name is on there and the class or the reading group that you are attending. So I'm going to keep this short because I really want to hear today's event. I already heard some of it. It's great. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Rob Capolo here today. Rob is a composer, conductor, music commentator who's traveled the world as guest speaker and host of What Makes It Great. He's the author of three books, What Makes It Great, short masterpieces, great composers, and I would think I messed this up. Short masterpieces, and then great composers. All you have to do is listen. Oh, I did mess it up. All you have to do is listen music from the inside out. I didn't put my commas in right. Sorry about that. As long as they buy the book, it doesn't matter if you get the title yeah. right. But but I'm really excited. He's got a forthcoming book that my wife's going to get me for Christmas. She doesn't know that, but she does now. And it's called um, Listening for America: Inside the Great American Songbook from Gershwin to Sondheim. And actually, tomorrow night here in this auditorium, Friday, they're going to have. Um, concert on the Great American Songbook, so all this great music from Gershwin and people like that. So today Rob will present All You Have to Do is Listen. As I was writing this today, I was playing some music by George Gershwin, actually, and although I was hearing it, I wasn't really listening, probably a mortal sin to some musicians, but um, so I took a brief break to actually listen to the music, and it matters in music, listening matters in music as well as in business, and this is what we are going to learn today. So I want to thank the five student musicians who are participating in the quintet. quintet. We have on violins Emilia Carter and Rose Corelli, Joseph Steinbert on viola, Adela Hotchkiss on cello, and Thomas Pratt on double bass. I also want to thank the professor, Paul Yark. So thank you, musicians, and thank you, Rob. You guys enjoy the show. Great. Before could we turn that down a little bit? It does feel a little like the voice of God at this moment. Could, which is, of course, appropriate, but could you just... Uh, better. Uh, even maybe a little bit less? Even less? That's great. Yeah. Good. Before I get started, I always like to have a sense of whom I'm talking to. Uh, so, uh, even though you don't have to have the slightest interest in classical music for today's program, so you can now be relieved, you have no interest required. I am curious to know how many of you, or if any of you, would say that you regularly go to classical music concerts, regularly buy or stream classical CDs, or regularly listen to classical music on the radio if you can find it. You're classical music fans. Do we have any classical music fans? Wow, that's a larger number than I thought. Okay, not bad. How many of you wouldn't call yourself fans? You wouldn't commit one of your car radio buttons to a classical station, but but you sort of occasionally listen to classical music along with other kinds of music. Okay, good. Now I want you to be honest here. How many of you think the only thing worse than listening to an hour of classical music would be to listen to somebody talking about listening to classical music for an hour? Nobody? How many people really hate this stuff, just really can't bear it? No one's honest enough to admit it? 
Well, that's my favorite audience. All right, good. I want to get into today's program by way of the humiliating personal experience I had when I was just about the same age as you that led directly to everything I want to talk with you about today. When I was 19, I dropped out of Yale to my parents' horror uh, to go to France to study with one of the world's most famous composition teachers at the time. Her name was Nadia Boulanger. Does anyone here recognize that name? Anyone? Oh, a few people. Okay, good. Uh, though in the music world, she's known for having taught some of the 20th century's most famous composers and musicians. She taught Gershwin, Stravinsky, Copeland, Leonard Bernstein, Daniel Barenbaum, Astor Piazzolla, Quincy Jones, and of course, most importantly, most importantly me. If she's known at all to the general public, it's from the 1970 movie Love Story, in which Ally McGraw gets a scholarship to study harpsichord with Boulanger in Paris, but instead decides to stay home, marry Ryan O'Neill, get leukemia, and die. In any case, when I went to Boulanger for my very first lesson, I was preparing for a piano competition. And so I went for my very first lesson, and there was a required piece by Mozart. Now, you have to understand what it's like to go to the Boulanger apartment for your first lesson at age 19. Now, I mean, the national government of France has named the street after her. She lives on Place Boulanger. You are walking up the stairs that every famous musician in the 20th century walked up, and you're sitting at a piano that Stravinsky played the Rite of Spring for her, the piano that he wrote Les for her, the piano that every major musician in the entire world, practically, has sat at. And I sat down to play her my Mozart required piece. And she hit me. Now, at the time, she was somewhere around 250 years old. She was supposed to be blind, but she hit me right in the shoulder, that place that really hurts, right there. And she hits me in the shoulder, and she says, Gepilov, this is grotesque. She says, you play this exquisite passage as if it were this. How many of you heard the difference? You know, I'd very good. I, I would love to tell you that I heard the difference and I said, Mademoiselle, I'm so glad I dropped out of college. I now understand it all. I didn't hear the difference either. I like to tell myself I was recovering from having been called Kapilov and grotesque in the same sentence for the first time, not to mention having been hit in the arm by a 250-year-old blind woman. But in any case, she went on to explain and she said, Mozart would never have written this. <laughs> Repeating those notes insults the listener. Once I've done this, why would I do this again? Mozart writes, which is so beautiful. Now this is subtle, listen closely. She also says he would never have written just three notes in this chord, this is subtle, but he adds one note, listen to the difference. Beautiful, ordinary, beautiful. So instead of this, Mozart writes, which is so beautiful. And then not this, but this. And at that moment, I realized two important things. First, I realized that the difference between good and great, not just in music, but everywhere, the difference between good and great is both enormous and infinitesimal. It's hundreds of inspired choices made by a composer, a CEO, a company, a parent, a spouse, or a student, measure by measure, conversation by conversation, and project by project. The difference between good and great, enormous and infinitesimal. I also realize there's an enormous difference between hearing and listening. Though I'd been hearing those notes go by for months as I was practicing, I had never really listened to them. Real listening required paying attention to what I was hearing in a completely new way. And the more I studied with Boulanger, the more I realized that what all these great composers had in common was great listening, and in particular a kind of listening that I believe is at the heart of all creativity, leadership, and collaboration that I want to talk with you about today that I'm going to call listening for possibility. You know, we tend to think of creativity as a kind of an inner game, as if you need to come up with something new, a new idea, a new product. You need to shut out the outside world, turn inward, and create out of the deepest, innermost recesses of your innermost imagination. But the great composer Stravinsky says it's just the opposite. He says creativity does not begin in here with thinking. It begins out there with observing what's right in front of your nose. Now, I'm sure you all know some of the famous business stories. Track coach Jim Bowerman has waffles for breakfast, thinks deeply about the shape and the texture of the waffle. To use my phrase, listens for possibility and comes up with the idea for the first waffle-sold athletic shoe for Nike. 
Or Swiss engineer Gerard de Mastragos, hiking in the woods, comes back with burrs stuck to his pant leg, thinks deeply about why they stick so tightly. To use my phrase again, listens for possibility and comes up with the idea of Velcro, exactly. Extraordinary invention and innovation can come from simply looking and listening to what's right in front of your nose in radically new ways. And today I want to take you deeply inside the mind and music of Mozart to see what it can teach us about the difference between good and great, creativity, innovation, leadership, collaboration, and most of all, listening for possibility. Now, how many of you out there have heard Mozart's Eine Kleine Nacht music or A Little Night music? Okay, good. How many of you raised your hands feel morally superior to the people who did not raise their hands? That's the whole point of classical music. Okay, good. Now, I want to get started by having our fantastic quintet here play you just the first 22 measures of this piece. For the last time this afternoon, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself. Then we are going to go back and take apart this opening to within an inch of its life to see if we can learn to listen like Mozart. Here's the first 22 bars of Eine Kleine Nacht music. <coughs> Don't they sound fantastic? Yes? That's the right answer. Now, one of the amazing things about Mozart's music is the pace of invention, the speed of the musical thought. You know, I was reading recently an interview with an Intel executive, and he said that at the very same time the marketing team is releasing the new fifth or sixth generation chip to the public downstairs, the research team upstairs has already finished work on the sixth or seventh generation chip that will make the one they're releasing to the public downstairs obsolete. The pace of invention in the business world, as you know, is extraordinary, but it cannot compare to the pace of invention in Mozart. So let's learn this famous opening together. Now, Mozart's opening, metaphorically Mozart's company, starts with a single note. I sing bum, you copy. Bum. That was pitiful. Here we go. Bum. B-U-M, that's what it says in the manuscript. I sing, you copy. Bum. All right, immediately he starts to innovate, add a new feature to the product. We take bum and we add a lower note. I sing you copy. Bum, bum. All right, this is so successful, they immediately franchise in three cities. And suddenly we've got bum, bum in three cities. I sing you copy. Bum, 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 sing. All right, so now we've got three ideas. Suddenly we're going to turn all of this into an actual product. What have we got? We've got a note, we've got a pair, we've got three pairs, let's turn all this innovation into a product by putting it all together and giving it a rhythm. I sing you copy. Bum, 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 go. Right, now that's almost Mozart, but what makes it great is the extra innovation at the end. Sing our almost Mozart version one more time, ready, sing. Raise your hand when you hear the extra innovation. That extra note at the end is what makes it fantastic. Sing that version. Ready? Go. But now you have to look incredibly surprised by those two notes at the end, as if it's the greatest thing you've seen since iPhone 11. Here we go. Ready? Sing. Now, the minute you've got a melody, you've also got a rhythm. I want you to clap the rhythm that you just sang, but don't sing it. So sing it in your head, but clap the rhythm. Ready, go. And the moment you have a rhythm, you can use that same rhythm for the second half of the idea with different notes. I play what comes next. As soon as I finish, you clap the rhythm I play. Clap. 
same rhythm, two different notes, but the two ideas connect through their rhythm, like two lines of rhyming poetry that connect through their rhythm, even though the words are different, like two divisions of a company that connect through their shared infrastructure or shared core corporate values. All right, so now you've got a great opening idea. When you've got a great opening idea, where you have a clear corporate identity or a great product, clear corporate identity, on-demand drone delivery service, on-demand Uber. Once you've got a great idea, you want the listener or the consumer to focus on this without any distraction. Now, Mozart could have put the great idea over here in the melody with some pointless distracting chords over here, extraneous information that confuses the marketing message. Now, he didn't, but I did. So we're going to put the melody over here and some pointless distracting chords over here that I added, and it sounds like this. I told them to look cheery and pointless and distracted, and I thought they did a pretty good job at that. It was hard for them, but they did well. All right, so we've got this pointless idea. To focus yourself on that idea right away from the opening notes, Mozart has all the instruments play the same melody in unison so there can be no distraction. Listen to the focus of Mozart's version. This is the entire company on message, speaking as one in unison, not this. <laughs> Mozart, focus. <clears throat> now, I'm going to spend almost 10 or 15 minutes on the next 10 seconds of music. Not only because it's such a fantastic example of the difference between good and great, but it's also a master class or almost a seminar on the art of listening. Have any of you read Malcolm Gladwell's first book, The Tipping Point? Anyone read that book? Great. It has a wonderful subtitle. The subtitle of the book is How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference. And these 10 seconds of music are a master class on how little things can make a big difference. Now, let's start by looking behind the scenes, not first at the melody, the CEO or the leader, but the notes that go behind the melody, the accompaniment, or what we're going to think of as the support staff. Now, like so many Mozart pieces, this has a steady beat that you could tap your foot to. It goes about this speed. Dum, bum, 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 bum. To give you a feel for that, I want you to count from one to eight and then say stop like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stop. Ready, go. One, two, three. You know, Boulanger always used to say that if you couldn't count from one to eight like it was the most exciting thing in your life, you would have that kind of a life. So let's hear you count from one to eight as if this is the most fantastic story you've ever told me. Like one, two, no way, three, four, five, I can't believe it. One to eight with life. Ready, count. One, two, what? No way. So, and stop. St what a weak stop, though, at the end. Finish with the climax. Here we go. One more time. Ready, count. One, two, what? Five. No way. Seven, eight, stop. Fantastic. Now, Mozart could have written one chord for each of your beats for the support staff. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stop. To give you a feel for that, I want you to count from one to eight again out loud and do one clap per beat. I'll do it first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stop. Try that. Ready, go. Excellent, not bad. Now, Mozart could have put his melody over here and had the accompaniment, the support staff, plodding along with one chord per beat, and it would have sounded awful. Now, I want you to get here. I'm not changing any notes of Mozart. All I'm changing is the rhythm. Remember, the difference between good and great is both enormous and infinitesimal. All of Mozart's notes, but the accompaniment plodding along one per beat. Ready. <laughs> has a kind of beer hall polka kind of feel to it. And I thought they did an excellent job. I told them they had to do full body commitment on each note. Excellent. Now, this sounds sort of pretty awful and plotting. Let's pretend you're the new CEO. You come in. This is your support staff plodding along. And you decide you've got to innovate and improve efficiency. So you institute a health and fitness program. And suddenly, everyone in the support staff starts running. They lose weight. And all of a sudden, they can not only do one per beat, one, two, three, four, but they can do two per beat, one, two, three, four. So not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stop. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stop. 
the notes are the same, all we're doing is twice as fast. So now I want you to count from one to eight, and instead of one, two, three, four, one clap per beat, I want you to do two claps per beat like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stop. Let's try that, ready, go. Not quite together, and still count out loud. I've got to hear the counting, one more time. Ready, go. Okay, now I want you to pretend this is so Mozartian, and you're wearing a wig, it's period. Oh yes, one, two, three, four. With character, here we go. Ready, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good, now I want you to listen to how much better this sounds. I am not changing a single note. The only difference is instead of the support staff doing this, they're doing this. And listen to how much better it sounds. <laughs> Better, right? Now, if you're listening casually, you might well think that that was Mozart's version. But if it were, we wouldn't be paying attention to it 200 years later. I was very fortunate to work with Michael Eisner for six months when he was the CEO of the Disney company, and we worked on a project together. And one of the things he always used to say at meetings was, good companies meet customer expectations, but great companies exceed customer expectations. The version you just heard met customer expectations. No one's running out of the hall. For Salieri, this would be a fantastic day. Nothing bad about this version. Let's see if we can exceed customer expectations. So let's say your health and fitness program is an enormous success, and suddenly you've got a small group of superstars who have become world-class sprinters. They can now not only do one per beat, one, two, three, four, they can do two per beat, they can even do four per beat. But since that hurts my arm, we're going to do it like this. So now I want you to count from one to eight and do four per beat on your legs like one, two, three, four, one through eight and stop. Here we go. Ready, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stop. And you just learned a valuable lesson about orchestra playing. If you finish together, no one knows what happened in the middle. <laughs> If your product is a success, everyone forgets about the mess during the development stage. Everything matters on how it finishes. Now, listen to how much better Mozart's version is, and I want you to tell me who has it. In Mozart's version, the melody's over here. Most of them are playing two per beat. One person is playing four per beat. By the way, first violin, second violin, viola, cello, double bass. One person is playing four per beat and it makes the entire texture sparkle. This is the difference. Remember, the difference between good and great is enormous and infinitesimal. No notes are different. Everyone playing two per beat. Melody here, who tell me who's playing four per beat? Here we go, Mozart. <laughs> Was it him? No. Was it her? No. By the way, speak up, speak up. If you're wrong, it doesn't matter. I'm going to Stanford next week to give a talk called Fail, Fail Again, Fail Better. So feel free to fail, fail again, fail better. So it wasn't him. Was it her? Was it him? Oh, are you related? Okay. Was, was it her? Yes, stand up. This is the big moment. This is why she's paying $30,000 a year. Now, I want you to really listen to closely. She's the one who makes it great. They're all going two per beat, bum, 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 bum. But she's going, and that's what makes the entire texture sparkle. So listen to her big moments. Spot if I could have a spotlight on her, I would right now. Here we go. Mozart. Ah. <laughs> Take a bow. This is her big moment, yes. But balance is everything. If everybody played four per beat, it would sound grotesque, like your company was hit by an IRS tax audit and an SEC investigation at the same time. Here's what it sounds like if everybody's playing four per beat. <laughs> Don't try that version at home, okay. Now, that's the accompaniment. This is what makes the support staff great. Now let's turn to what you're all interested in at the business school, CEOs and leadership. Let's turn to the melody. And let's start off with a not so great CEO. Let's start off with a CEO who has this annoying habit of repeating himself on every downbeat. Repeat, repeat, repeat. I know no one here is like this. Repeat. 
Bob, here's what it might sound like. This is almost Mozart, an annoying CEO who repeats himself on every downbeat like this. We... <clears throat> If you knew how long it take her to play that badly, it was such an effort. I thought she made a fantastic job. Really hard to make her play that ugly, but that was excellent. All right, now, this is obviously not working with the company, and so they send him off to the business school here in Louisville, and they tell him, you know, you've got to stop repeating yourself over and over again on every downbeat. It just doesn't work. And so he decides, okay, well, I'm going to decorate my second repeat with the note above it, a little leaning note that we call a appoggiatura, just say appoggiatura. It's a fantastic word for cocktail party conversations. You say, oh, the way they played those appoggiaturas, it was so exquisite. Very useful word. Now, when you hear the first appoggiatura, it's going to sound fantastic. It's not repeat. The first one sounds fantastic, but this is a lesson in how innovation must be continuous. This is the lesson that BlackBerry never learned. Okay, so now what you're going to hear is, I hope no one here is working for Black, okay. Um, you're going to hear is, listen very closely, you're going to hear repeat, then you're going to hear one appoggiatura, and it's going to sound great. The second one will sound annoying, the third one will sound intolerable. So this is a lesson on how innovation must be continuous. So it's repeat, three appoggiaturas, first one's good, second awful, third one worse. Here we go. First. Nice. So the first one is great, second awful, third there. So what are we going to do? Well, let's review for a second. We started off with two repeated notes with repeat. Repeat. We initially copied it with another repeat like this. Repeat. We made it slightly better with an appoggiatura like this. An even fancier innovation is to alternate the two notes quickly, what we call trill. Self-driving cars. Fantastic idea. Now, when you hear the first trill, it will sound even better than the appoggiatura did. But the second trill will sound even worse, and the third one will be the most annoying of all. So again, a lesson on continuous innovation. You're going to hear repeat, three trills. Listen closely to how each trill gets successively worse. Here we go. Nice. I think she helped us along a little bit. All right, so what does Mozart do having gone to the Louisville business program? He learns that you have to continuously innovate, and I want you to tell me what he does. So now you've got three options. I'm going to hold up my fingers at the three downbeats, and afterwards I want you to tell me what Mozart did. So you've got three options. It could either be repeat the same note twice. It could be our appoggiatura or our leaning note. By the way, if you're interested, ask me during the Q&A about Adele and appoggiaturas. You know the singer Adele? Ask me about Adele and appoggiaturas during the Q&A. Anyway, so it could either be a repeat, or it could be an appoggiatura, or it could be trill. You tell me what Mozart does. He starts with repeat. I'll hold up my fingers at the three places. Here we go. All right, so we started with the repeat. What came next? What came next? What came next? Exactly. How many people got it wrong and are feeling really badly about themselves at this point in time? That is our goal in classical music. Okay, good. Let's do it one more time to make sure. But the point is, notice that he's continuously varying the approach. We've got a repeat, then we've got a trill, then we've got an appoggiatura, and then we have a trill. Let's do it one more time to make sure everybody gets it. Repeat, trill, appoggiatura, and trill. Okay, but there's still one more thing that's fantastic about this. Now, I want you to be honest here. How many people here have ever had an incredibly boring job at some point in your life? Okay, someone tell me like what their most boring job ever was. Who raised their hand? Just tell me someone's really, yeah, what's your most boring job? Cashier at Walgreens. Okay, good. Let me have one more. Yeah? Oh, I love, could you stand up and say that? I love the way you said it as well. Go ahead, one more time. A deputy tax assessor. That's great. Now, um, for some reason, which is not necessarily correct, violas in the classical period have a reputation of being the deputy tax assessor and have the most boring parts in the classical period. And if you go on the web, there are more viola jokes on the web than anything else about music, the deputy tax assessor. Now, 
Mozart could have written an incredibly boring version here, and it would have fit perfectly. And I want you to raise your hand when you're bored, but in particular kind of boredom. For me, boredom means you hear a pattern, you get the pattern, you think you know what's coming next, and is there anything sadder in life than thinking you know what comes next? And that's what actually comes next. So I want you to raise your hand the moment you think you know the pattern, and watch how you listen. No, raise your hand when you think you know the pattern, and then let's see if your pattern is correct. And it does repeat. Here we go. If you're not all bored, it's his fault. Do it one more time. Get them bored. Go ahead. Here's the pattern. You know what's going to come next? You know it? Got it. All right, now I want you to raise your hand just at the moment where it might become this incredibly boring job, the deputy tax assessor suddenly gets to meet the president, and all of a sudden you get five, and that's hopefully a good thing, and you get five surprising notes. Raise your hand when you hear the surprising version that Mozart adds. Go ahead. Ah. And the amazing thing about this is those five surprising notes get played by the first violin an octave higher, one beat later, and they make a little round like this. I'm going to put together just those two parts and see if you can hear this fantastic round between the two of them like this. Got it? Could you hear that? Do you need it one more time? You got it. One more time, one more time. Here we go. One, two, three. Now suddenly, not only is the boring deputy tax assessor job become interesting, but it's actually providing key material to the C-suite, to the CEO over here, who then takes the idea from the boring job there. Suddenly, the deputy tax assessor and the CEO are having lunch together and playing duets on the weekend. Now, we're going to put this all together, and this is really the point, because we're going to put all of this together and you are going to have the perfect metaphor for the perfect company and the perfect relationship. A company in which everyone contributes to the whole in their own unique way. Now, what are you listening for? Because you have to be on the edge of your seat to really hear all this. What you're listening for is our continuously innovating CEO who is playing, what is she playing? She's playing repeat, then what? Trill, then appoggiatura, then trill. So you've got to hear her. Then you're listening to our fitness craze second violin who is playing Four per beat, you're listening to our much maligned deputy tax successor here, who is providing five surprising notes to the CEO over here, and then everything is grounded and held together by the steady, reliable, repeated notes of the double bass and the cello, the accounting department. <laughs> All right, see if you can hear the whole thing, everything happening at once. Pete, trill, appoggiatura, trill, da -da 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 -da. five surprising notes, Dum -bum 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 -bum. see if you can hear it all. <laughs> Could you hear it all? Do you, do you need it again? One more time? I told them if you didn't say yes, we failed. If you didn't hear all that, we had failed. That's the thing, there's so much going on if you only can learn how to listen to it. Let's do it one more time, see if you can hear it all. Now, the reason I've spent so long on these 10 seconds of music is not only that's such a fantastic example of the difference between good and great and listening for possibility, but once you get a feel for this kind of writing here, you'll find it everywhere in Mozart. Though the surface of the music might seem simple, if you listen closely, there's always something surprising going on. Things are never as simple as you think. For example, in classical period music, like rhyming poetry, even numbered units, four and eight, are regular, but great music, like great poetry, and like great products are often subtly irregular. Let's say a lesser poet than Robert Frost had written his great poem, Fire and Ice. It might have been all regular, predictable, deputy tax successor, four beat lines. And it might have been something like this. Some say the world will end in fire, four. 
Some say the world will end in ice. Four. From what I've tasted of desire. Four. I hold with those who favor fire. Four. Is there anything more boring in life than da 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 get the pattern da 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 and then sadly da 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 a kind of Hallmark greeting card. Anyone here who works for Hallmark? Reading. Good, good, good. You're not funded by them or anything like that? Good, okay. Now, so instead of 4444, four, 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 here's what Robert Frost does. Some say the world will end in fire. Four. Some say in ice. Two. Which is already so elegant. Just a simple four to two. One more time. Some say the world will end in fire. Four. Some say in ice. Now we've got possibilities. Now we've got a pattern. We're on the edge of our seat trying to see what comes next. Four or two. From what I've tasted of desire, four. Here's the key moment. We did four or two. We just did four. What do you think is going to come next? Two. I favor fire. But that's not what he does. He does from what I've tasted of desire, four. I hold with those who favor fire. So you've got suddenly four, two, and four, four, but the last four is not really a four, it's a not two. Get that in your ear, that subtlety. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. And then you're on the edge of their seat, never knowing whether it's going to be four, two, four, four, or what it's going to be. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate, all four. To say that for destruction, ice, we've got four, 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 but we finish with is also great, too, and would suffice, too. Now, the same thing happens in music. Our next phrase of Mozart starts with a four-measure unit, and it starts to repeat, but it gets chopped off after three bars by a surprising accent, and that accent is repeated once, not twice. So see if you can hear four bars, start to repeat, whoops, surprise accent, whoops, repeated once, not twice, like this. And one, two, three, four. Repeat one, two, three, shock. Accent, no accent. It's these wonderful irregularities that give Mozart's themes such life and make the difference in his operas between flat cardboard stereotypes and living, breathing human beings that make the difference between meeting customer expectations and exceeding customer expectations. I'm going to play Mozart's second theme, and all I'm going to do is change one rhythm, how little the difference is that makes the difference between good and great. All the notes are Mozart's. All I'm going to do is change one rhythm to an annoying buh da buh at the beginning of the first and third measure. All the notes are Mozart's. buh da buh da buh And here again. So my version began with five even boring notes. La, 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 la. Sing that as boringly as you possibly can on La. Ready, go. Oh, that was much too excited. Just imagine you're at a boring lecture about music. You're stuck in Comstock Hall. Five boring notes. Ready, go. Now, all Mozart does is change the rhythm. I want you to really get that listening for possibility. You know, we think we have to do enormous things to make a great company. Sometimes the little is changed. Instead of la, 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 all he does is change the rhythm. La, la. Sing that. Ready, go. If you sort of shake your head and look up, it sounds better. Here we go. Ready and la. So instead of my boring version, la, 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 Mozart does this. And here, a moment for the accounting department. The vice president takes over the company. No way. The possibilities that Mozart can hear in the tiniest details are truly extraordinary. There's only one other idea in this entire movement, and in and of itself, it's utterly ordinary. This is waffles for breakfast. This is burr stuck to your pant legs. There's nothing special about this idea. I mean, this is not a genius. But let's look at this idea from the point of view of a composer. Now, the idea is made up of two fragments. I'm going to call it fragment one and fragment two. Now, this is a metaphor. This could be two companies looking to see if they're going to merge, two divisions looking how they're going to share resources. But I think since you're young and you're sort of in business school and you're sort of college, let's make this be two people in a long-term relationship or a marriage and seeing if you have a potential future together uh, between fragment one and fragment two. All right, let's see what the two of you have in common. Uh, 
I'm going to play fragment one, and I want you to just tell me how many notes are in fragment one. You can count on your fingers if you like. How many notes? Remember, fail, fail again, better, shout it out. How many? Seven. Very good. Okay. So how, let's look at fragment two. How many notes in fragment two? Seven. All right, so they both have that in common. This is a basis for a relationship, enough for college, right? Okay. They both have seven notes. Now let's see if they actually have any particular notes in common. I'll try not to give it away. And fragment two. Any notes in common? Okay, so they have the last, I mean, this is a really potentially fruitful relationship. We've got seven notes in common. We've got the last two notes in common. Now let's look a little closer at their individual profiles. Let's, say, let's call it a he and a she just for now. Um, we start off with a leap up, leap up. Listen closely, you're gonna have to sing it in a minute. Then a scale down, and then two notes, which it's important to learn this technical terminology we'll call dida. So, I want you to learn leap up, scale down, dida, and sing it. Leap up, scale down, dida. Here we go. Let's do it slowly so you can really hear the intervals. Ready? Sing. Leap up, scale down. And now try it fast like this. Leap up, scale down, dida. Ready? Go. Now, how many repeated notes in fragment two before we get to dida? Listen closely. How many repeated notes? Five. So we're going to call this one one, two, three, four, five, D, da. Sing that. One, two. Now I'm going to put the two of them together, one slow and then at tempo. Leap up, scale down, D, da. One, two, three, four, five, D, da. Sing. Leap up. I didn't hear the second part. One more time. Ready? Go. Let's look at the history of their relationship. Okay, so we start off, everything's fine between them, they're happy, we're in a major key. Leap up, scale down, Dita. One, two, three, four, five, Dita. Now, what's the key to this is they all have their own independent identities. This is what makes a good relationship. They have something in common, seven notes, two final notes, but they have individual profiles. He's a leap up, scale down, Dita. She's a five repeated note, Dita. Everything is fine for the beginning of their relationship. They're in major keys, they get to repeat, everything is good. Now, I want you to raise your hand when you hear the first crack in their relationship. Uh-oh, trouble. Okay. Now, like all couples, they change and develop, but they still keep their basic identities. They might leap different distances, have different scales, start on different notes, but he is always going to be some kind of a leap up, some kind of a scale down, and dida, and she's always going to be some kind of five repeated notes, and dida. Listen to it develop and change as a relationship. Dida. She's five repeated notes, and dida. One, two, three. He does his scale lower, but he's still a leap up, scale down, dida. She's still five repeated notes in dida. One, two, three, four, five, dida. One more time. Leap up, scale down, dida. And one, two, three, four, five, dida. But then midlife crisis. He buys a Porsche, starts to lose his fundamental identity, and instead of being a leap up, and a scale down, he horrifically changes his fundamental identity and becomes a rising scale. It's always trouble to a relationship when you become a rising scale. So instead of leap up, scale down, he becomes a rising scale too. And the only thing that's keeping the relationship together is Dida, the children. All that's keeping them together is Dida, the children. A rising scale to Dida. She tries to change with him. She gets rid of her whole fundamental identity. She's no longer five repeated notes. She tries to become a rising scale to Dida along with him. But you can hear by the intervals how difficult this is for her. A rising scale to Dida. They try one more time in unison 
for the sake of the children, to become a rising scale to Dida. But the children leave home. They're at Louisville now. Dida disappears. And instead of a rising scale to Dida, Dida disappears. They're all alone. There's no one home but them. And then on the brink of disintegration, they somehow find a way to go on. And two thrilling measures, couples therapy, help them find their way home and save the marriage. And we're we started. Now, I want you to hear this entire journey, the rise and fall of Dida, a marriage and its collapse, and it happens in 20 seconds, and all for listening to possibility in one tiny idea. Here's that whole thing happening in real time with the group. See if you can hear it all. <coughs> Leap up, scale down, Dida. One, two, three, four, five, Dida. Everything's fine. Dida. Leap up, trouble, Dida. One, two, three, four, five, Dida. Leap up, scale down, Dida. One, two, three, four, five, Dida. Leap up, scale down, Dida. One, two, three. Midlife crisis. There's nothing left but Dida. There's nothing left but Dida. She disappears. But somehow, <laughs> we are back. <clears throat> Excellent job, good. Now, those surprises are here. They continue until the very last moment. You have to innovate until the very last moment. The first half of this movement ends with a lyrical measure followed by three short chords like this. Three short chords. The same music comes back lower. If it had copied it exactly, you'd have another lyrical measure and three short chords. But in the second bar, instead of that second bar being that, we get what my Jewish grandmother calls a kvetch, a complaint. So now you hear, instead of lyrical measure three short chords, you hear lyrical measure kvetch, complaint, like this. Mm. I hate my job, I hate my job. But then when it happens again, we continuously innovate. Now the lyrical measure holds the company together, but instead of three short chords or kvetch, we float to the heavens in the second bar like this. Mm. Three soft chords should have ended the movement like this. Mm. Instead, a loud second chord surprises us and leads to the ending like this. Accent. Mm. <coughs> and repeat. Lower parts, one dotted rhythm. <clears throat> the only dotted rhythm, the only bum 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 in the entire movement, save to make the ending special innovation to the last possible moment. Bravo, well done. All right, now comes the really fun part of the day. I'm going to switch gears completely, and I want to talk directly about leadership. This is really the most fun part of the day, and I hope we have our cameras available for this thing. You know, the idea that musicians might have anything to offer people in the business world initially came as a surprise to me when about 15 years ago, after conducting a concert at Lincoln Center, a professor from the Fordham Business School came up to me and asked me if I'd be willing to talk to his business school class about the connection or relationship between conducting and leadership. He said he was teaching a course on leadership, and he was struck while watching the concert by the way the relationship between the conductor and the orchestra seemed to embody so many of the principles of the course in a clear way. And also, by the way, so many different conductors seem to embody so many different styles of leadership. Now, I'd never really thought about conducting from that point of view, but it sounded interesting, so we spent a month together putting together a program with an appropriately academic title, Conducting as a Management Model, or something like that. I can't remember what I said, but I do remember one of the distinctions he made over and over again in the course was a distinction between what he called stakeholders and employees. Someone define stakeholder for me down here. What's a stakeholder? An owner, give me another, what else? Yeah, interest in the business. And contrast that with employee. Say again. Yeah, a worker sort of punches the time cards. And he said that one of the most important tasks for any leader is to be able to turn employees into stakeholders. 
So let's see if you can do it. I'm going to teach you to conduct the opening eight measures of the last movement of this piece, and I'm going to invite you up here, uh, three or four of you, to see your leadership styles. So it uh, doesn't matter if you know a thing about music, but we're going to learn how to conduct this, and then have three or four of you come up and show us your leadership style. And I promise it will be revealing. Um, uh, good. So the first thing you need to do when you're going to conduct something is learn the tune. So let's learn the tune. It's in two parts, which are almost the same. So I'll play it first, and we'll sing it on la. So it goes, the first part goes like this. I'm going to give you a ready, go, and then you'll sing. Ready, go. Let's do that again since I heard no one. Here we go. Ready, go. Again, here we go. Ready, go. Second half starts the same, only thing that's different is the end. I'll play it and then you try it. Let's try it. Ready, go. Again, ready, go. I'll play the whole thing through once, then you try the whole thing. Ready, go. Try it. Ready, go. One more time. Ready, go. Great. Now, the basic conducting motion for this is a down and an up, a kind of reverse J or fish hook. Down, up. Let's try four of those without any rhythm. Here we go. Down, up, keep going, try four of them. I'm looking for victims, good, down, up, down, up. Now the hardest part is to get those very first notes to start, the la 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 la. And the trick is to do a very good ready and a sharp snap on go, as if you're making a check mark in the air. So it would be like this, ready, go, bataka bum. In fact, I find bataka bum easier to say than la 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 la. So we're just going to practice that much. We're going to go, ready, go, bataka bum, and you say bataka bum, and if you can't conduct yourself together, we're in trouble. Here we go. So let's practice just that much. Here we go. Ready, go, bataka bum. One more time. Ready, go, bataka bum. Say bataka bum really loudly. Here we go. Ready, go, bataka bum. And you have to have the rhythm in your body. I can tell already. Here we go. Ready, go, bataka bum. Then you're going to do seven up downs and a stop like this. Ready, go, but they one, da, 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 two, da, 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 three, da, 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 four, but they five, ba, 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 six, ba, 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 seven, and stop. Let's try that. Here we go. Arms up, ready, go. Ready, go, but they go one, da, 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 two, da, 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 three, da, 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 four, but they five, ba, 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 six, ba, 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 seven, and stop. Got it? Now, the left hand. In the fourth bar, there's a fantastic run in the second violin and the viola that to me always sounds like Mozart laughing. Oh. So I want you to point to that. Uh, it's how it sounds like this. Uh, uh, sorry. Whoops. So I want you to point to that with the left hand to him, and then I want the left hand to do stop. So the whole thing is going to look like this. Ready, go, but they go one, da, 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 two, da, 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 three, da, 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 point, but they go five, ba, 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 six, ba, 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 seven, and stop. All right, let's try the whole thing. Here we go. Ready, go, but they go one, da, 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 two, da, 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 three, da, 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 point. Oh, good. Five, ba, 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 that was pretty good. Seven, and stop. One more try, and then we'll invite you up. Here we go, here we go. Ready, go, but they go one, da, 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 two, ba, da, ba, three, da, 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 point, but they go five, ba, 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 six, ba, 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 seven, and stop. All right, now I'd like to have at least two people who have no knowledge of music whatsoever, um, and just to see that they'll do no worse or better than the people who do have knowledge of music. Okay, uh, who would like to do it? Raise hands here. It's really fun. Oh, you come up. Are you a musician? No, good, you come up, that's one. All right, we need, uh, let's say, two more. Who else? This is a big opportunity. You can put it on your resume, conducted. Here we go. Uh, yes, come on. Are you a musician? Great, fantastic. OK. And you're the one who had the boring job, right? Oh, no, OK, all right. OK. We don't want deputy attack successes up here. Um, maybe one more. Who else? Oh, you want to come? Good, are you a musician? OK, so we have one musician. Good, good, good. All right, good. Come up here. I mean, you know, standing and humiliating yourself in front of large crowds is perfect preparation for the business world. Okay. 
All right, so uh, let's see. Um, why don't you come, for, you want to go first? Sure. Okay, so let's do a little practice ourselves just before, with, this is without you, just practice. So you're going to have a ready, go. You can say ready, go. You have a ready, go, but they go one, da, 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 two, da, 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 three, da, 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 point, but they go five, ba, 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 six, ba, ba, seven, and stop. Okay, good. So now stand over here. Now, the other thing that's really important is to look really nicely at her because she's the one who can save your life, okay? <laughs> and most importantly, if you're a CEO, no matter what happens, bow at the end like it was a huge hit. Okay, good. So uh, you can say ready, go, get it in your body, and let's see what happens. Excellent job! Stay there, you're not done. Oh. Now, I have to tell you the truth. What I told the band was, no matter what they do the first time through, make it sound fantastic. And that's how it is with a company, right? If you have good people working for you, no matter who's waving the stick at the CEO, they can save the company and make it work. Now I want you to do it again, and I told them the second time, actually follow whatever he does. So let's see what happens this second time. <laughs> okay, first crisis in the IPO. All right. Now, it's always interesting to see when things fall apart, how do people react? Okay, I liked your thing, wait. Okay, now, no one was even playing at that point, but we were waiting. All right, so let's see if you can figure out what to do. Okay, now, not, not bad at all. First, one thing I liked was he stayed with it. He did have, I wish you could have seen his face. He had this crestfallen look. It was sort of like, um, it was like Neumann at the, the WeWork IPO, you know, who just got fired. It was like, I know this is really not working, but I'm just gonna pretend it's fine. Um, so you looked very despondent, but you did keep going, and then at the end there was a kind of, we're done. Okay, now try to do, actually, no, that was bad, that was good. You did, you did a great job, uh, applause there. All right. Also, I thought they gave him a better result than he deserved, actually, to tell you the truth. All right, now your turn. Let's have a practice here, just you and me. So before they start, so it's a ready. Three, four, and stop. Now, one of the most important things, whether you're a leader of anything, is to walk up there with a sense of what you want to accomplish. The most important thing is to actually have the rhythm in your body. You have to know what you want your company to do in every fiber of your being. Even if you have the worst technique and you can't read a balance sheet, if you know what the tempo is, I promise you they will be able to follow you. All right, so go ahead. And you can say ready, go, if you like. Not bad at all. First, stay there, stay there. First of all, I wish you could see the look on her face. She was happy to be CEO. She was like, she had that lowered lip bit, and she was like, oh yeah, this is fantastic stuff. All right, that was really, really good. Now do it again, and now they'll follow whatever she does. And, um, and now, since you're pretty good there, don't want you to say, ready, go. Somehow, you're going to have to get them to go because of the way you go. Okay, so it's up to you. I mean, either the company goes because of your leadership or not. Here we go. Okay, um, now, there is something interesting about saying stop after they've already stopped. Um, <laughs> but you did it with great commitment. Um, one other thing that's really interesting, I'll stay there, is that, um, did you notice, who was she looking at? No one that was playing. Um, what was interesting, and so often you see this with CEO, is you have an idea for the company in your head. It's not communicating to anyone around you, and you're not paying any attention to your employees, but you have an idea in your head. So you were conducting an idea in your head. See if you can actually make a connection to them, look at them, and actually make the company go with you, as opposed to, I've got an idea, and I hope they're doing it. I'm not really sure, but let's see. Okay, but I also like the foot thing. That's, that's, that's not, you've got a nice kick thing there, you know, going on, it's got a lot of character in that foot. Um, you shouldn't conduct with your foot, but we'll take character wherever we find it. Go ahead, one more time.
Okay, that was really revealing. Really, that was fantastic. Okay, so what happened? Tell me what happened. Yeah, so she starts, they, you started way too slow, and they were a little confused. But then what I liked about it was you said, okay, the company's losing a fortune, we're losing all our market share, but we're going to go down together. And we're going <laughs> to pretend it works, and we got into this ridiculously slow tempo, but we were doing it together, and everyone felt pretty comfortable losing the entire company's money. Um, but you did it together, which I liked about it, and you're still not getting rid of stopping after they've stopped, but that's okay, old habits die hard. <laughs> Excellent job, really great. All right, now come on. Now there's a lot of pressure on her. She's a musician. What do you play? Guitar. Guitar. What? It's guitar? I'm not sure what. You don't like guitar? Okay, good. All right, so let's have a practice session here one more time. So you've got a ready. Good. Oh, and casual too. Oh, excellent. All right, go ahead. <laughs> In general, that's really dangerous. When they're here and you go, whoops. <laughs> now, luckily, they aren't wind instruments. It's really bad when you do this and they're going, oh. Okay, okay. Yes, know your tempo, and you're going to give a ready go, right? Ready go, go ahead. <laughs> Very good in many ways. Stay there, stay there. Now, a lot of things that, one thing that was really interesting is she got backwards at the beginning, but she stayed backwards. So in other words, you were on two when they were on one, but it was very steady and it was all good. But now you also conducted a little bit like, I'm really sorry I'm here. I only play the guitar and it's really all right. But now actually enjoy the experience um, and, uh, and, and follow it. Yeah. So let's get our start. Ready, go. Now, one of the most important things is how do you start? You know, the very first chapter of my very first book, the one you're going to buy as soon as you leave this room, um, is called Beginnings Are Everything. How something begins. Now, the first thing is almost everyone here has tried to find the beginning of the company in their head, as opposed to out here. Look at the difference. I'm just going to do something different, and you tell me what I'm doing differently, OK? OK, now I'm going to start a different way. Ready? You see the difference? What did I do differently? What did I do differently? Yeah, I, I'm doing it with them as opposed to in my head. So make sure you contact them, get the tempo in your body. You know, in fact, if you go to concerts, you'll see that oftentimes conductors walk out very quickly and start the piece quickly because they've been thinking about the tempo in the dressing room for the entire intermission. And you walk out and you have the tempo in your head. Bum, bum, bum. But the tempo has to be your entire life. You've got to know what the company is about in every fiber of your being 24-7, even if you're not working on it. If you know the tempo, how fast does it go? Sing it to me. Good, good. Now, felt like you got that. You're walking out. You got that tempo, and you were going to communicate that somehow to them. Here we go. And enjoy them. <laughs> That's OK. Uh, just decide you're only going to do two of them, because they don't know which of these means go. So you're just going to do a one, two, but with a good two. Go ahead. <laughs> that was great. All right, it worked. Go ahead. One more time. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, excellent job. Take a bow. Well done. All right. Just one final thought before we hear this movement, and then we'll have our quick uh, Q&A. We're going to have a Mo the, we'll go through the first movement of Mozart. But just one final thought before we actually get to the Mozart. You know, I've talked a lot today about what I call listening for possibility. But I just very quickly want to talk about another kind of listening that I believe is at the heart of all creativity, innovation, leadership, and most of all, collaboration in any kind of a group, from a string quartet or symphony orchestra to a company, a project team, a staff, or even a family or marriage. Have any of you ever either been involved with or seen an improv comedy troupe? You all seen one of those? Okay, good. Um, anyone actually been in one? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Then you know that one of the most basic principles of all improv theater, which I think of as a way of listening, is an idea called yes and. And the idea of yes and listening is that if you're doing some kind of improvisation with your partner, whatever your partner suggests, it could be a line of dialogue, it could be a prop, it could be a gesture, whatever your partner suggests, you have to yes and it. In other words, say yes to it and build on it. So let's say I was starting an improvisation with all of you, and I just said, brr, it's cold in here. Someone yes and it. Say yes and. So brr, it's cold in here. Someone do yes and of it. Yes 
Yes and what? <laughs> you have to continue the narrative or else this is a very short television show, okay? So I say, brr, it's cold in here. Someone say yes and and add to it. It won't be cold Friday. And it won't be cold Friday. Someone yes and that. Yes, my beard y yes in your beard or beard? Okay, okay, good. Uh, so you get the idea of yes and. Now, what you can't say if I say brr, it's cold in here is no, it's not. That what's called blocking, and that would be the end. And I cannot stress how important this seemingly simple principle is. Though an orchestra might hate their conductor, though a string quartet might hate each other and have violent disagreements over how to play a piece of music until the moment they walk out on stage, at the moment of performance, everyone must say yes to whatever's occurring or else no magic will possibly happen. If the conductor starts the piece too quickly, as you saw here, or the first violinist starts the piece too loudly, the quartet or the orchestra must say yes to the tempo of the dynamics and adjust. You can dispute afterwards, you can fire the conductor, you can quit the quartet, whatever you like, but you must say yes while the performance is occurring. And I believe this kind of yes and listening is the key to collaboration everywhere. If someone from your company, from your project team, from your class, from your family offers a suggestion, your first hearing should be yes and. You should come to the idea, even if it's only for five seconds, from yes, as if the idea would be correct and helpful and useful, or even better, as if it was the best idea you ever heard, as if it would solve the problem in one sentence. Five seconds later, you can reject the idea. But if you have fully committed to its possibility, truly try the idea on. You know, most of us listen to suggestions through the filter of, I agree, or I disagree, already thinking of our response halfway through the other person's suggestion. Consider, rather than agreeing or disagreeing, simply trying it on. How would things look like if we did it that way? Because if you have fully committed to the possibility, truly tried it on, your quartet partner or team member or partner in a relationship or parent, child, or spouse will feel heard and the relationship as a whole can move forward. Plus, you will have opened yourself up to another possibility. You will have seen the world from someone else's point of view. You will have been changed. You know, one of the biggest barriers to innovation is that in order to innovate and change, and I know this sounds ridiculously simple, in order to innovate and change, you have to actually want to. Though nearly everyone would say they believe in risk and innovation and change, in my experience, most people would love to change just as long as they don't have to do anything different. But I do not believe that you can create change in a company, a project team, family, or in any relationship unless you are willing to change. And change is not only about what we decide to do, it's first and foremost about who we decide to be. What you decide to do as a CEO, a leader, a leader, a project team leader, or a partner, to be effective must truly grow directly out of who you first decide to be. And so before we finish with Mozart in our Q&A, I just want to leave you with one brilliant final quotation from the writer on mythology, Joseph Campbell, that has proved enormously useful to me throughout my career as I tried to decide who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And what he says is, you must be willing to get rid of the life you've planned in order to have the life that's waiting for you. You must be willing to let go of the life you've planned as you enter the school here in order to have the life that's waiting for you. Possibilities are everywhere. All you have to do is listen. And now we finish with Mozart and hopefully one of the most profound lessons of leadership that I can give you. Here we go. You tell me what the lesson is at the end.
All right, so what was the lesson? Yes? Yes, the first message is hire good people, get out of their way, and then when I stepped in, only step in on top of what they're already doing. Don't get in the way of what they're already doing. Add something on top of it, but don't try to recreate what they're already doing. So hire good people, get out of the way, let them do what they're doing, and then give a little direction here and there. That's the key to all of it. All right, I thought they did one more time for them. I thought they did a fantastic job. All right, we have a few minutes for questions for me or them. Anyone who has a comment, thought, anything? Yeah, sure. You want to know about Adele and Apaja tours? Oh, yes. OK, um, Adele and Apaja. Um, I, um, I did a, a show on National Public Radio for 10 years called What Makes It Great. So I got to know the people well. One day, I was just sitting in my office, and the phone rang, and it said NPR. And uh, NPR called me, uh, all things you know the show All Things Considered? So All Things Considered calls up, and they said, Rob, we're in an emergency state. We have to have something from you right away. And I said, what's happening? And she said, yesterday, there, I don't know if you saw this. This was about a year ago. There was an article in the New York Times appeared. Um, there was a research done that said the key to all emotion in music was appoggiaturas. And this article was released, and so they did a show on NPR, and the person said that Adele was the prime example of using appoggiaturas to produce emotion. And they had done a show the day before about Adele and appoggiaturas. And evidently, they had gotten a huge number of calls from those obnoxious musicologists, which is almost most of us, um, saying, wait a minute, you got it wrong. That was not an appoggiatura. So they called me up and they said, we're really, really desperate. We don't know if we got this right, but we have to publish something today. We have to say something on the show about 
about the attraction if we're wrong or we have to say we're right. Can we send a television crew to your house? We'll get them there in two hours. Can you tape a show about appoggiaturas? Because we have to air it this night. So anyway, I actually went and listened. And in fact, they did have it totally wrong. Uh, in fact, appoggiaturas are not the key to everything. But it made for this wonderful show. And it's all about those little leaning notes. And the truth is, there are lots of appoggiaturas. Um, but that's really like saying the key to all emotion in English is the word the. I mean, it's just a standard element. But they were so excited, and it really sort of, what I, the very first thing I said on the radio show is deciding whether or not this is an appoggiatura or not is exactly why people hate musicians. Because the term itself really doesn't matter whatsoever. But there are a lot of appoggiaturas in Adele. Uh, anyone else? Any question about anything or thought or comment? Here's a chance of a lifetime. Yes? Oh, what am I trying to get to you? Um, you know, one of the reasons um, I started the whole What Makes It Grow program, this is, that's a really good question, and I, and I have a, a sideways answer to it. Um, when I, I was very lucky when I was 23, I got appointed a professor at Yale, and I had a conductor of the orchestra, and so for a bunch of years from 23 till about 28, I got to conduct and be a professor at Yale. It was really fun. Then I got an offer to go to Broadway and conduct the Tony Award-winning musical um, at the time, and so for three foolish months, I tried to do both jobs at the same time. And I would sort of teach and conduct Beethoven symphonies during the day, then take the train to Broadway, conduct the show, and then take the 1120 train home after that. This is an answer to your question, I trust you. Um, um, and it was a really eye-opening experience, because whatever you think about that Broadway music, audiences got it. They spoke the language of that music. They were willing to pay enormous sums of money. I mean, we were the hottest show in town at the time. It was filled every night. And then I would go back and do this classical music. And out there, people seemed to not get it at all. And the difference every day between an audience who understood what you were saying as a conductor and an audience who didn't was huge. And I decided I didn't want to do music anymore if they weren't going to get it out there. And at the time, I ran across this wonderful quote from the poet Walt Whitman. And he said, to have great poets, there must be great audiences. Which for me meant to have great music, there must be great listeners. And so I thought, I have to actually do something about this. Now at the same time, and this is a story which I won't tell you, but it's a fun one, I somehow got asked to be a guest artist at the retreat for the creative writing staff of Hallmark Greeting Cards uh, in Kansas City. And there was a really great presentation that someone said. And what he said was, self-expression doesn't happen here, it happens out there. And that was really profound. In other words, we can think we're expressing something up here, playing music, shaking our head. But if you don't get it out there, we have said nothing. And then he said a really important sense that I think sentence that should be useful to all of you, not only in business, but everywhere in your life. He said, take responsibility for how people hear you. Take responsibility for other people's listening. And at that moment, I dropped out of my professorship. My parents couldn't believe it. I resigned from Yale. And I decided that I would take responsibility for America's listening. And I would try to make sure that when someone asked, how do you get across what they're hearing out there, um, I would do it. And that's where What Makes It Great began, which began as a radio series where I took only 10 seconds of music on National Public Radio a week. And for 15 minutes, I tried to make sure they would hear everything that was going on in those 10 seconds. Because I thought if I could get America to really hear 10 seconds, I could change how America listened. And we had a million listeners, and I did it for 10 years. And then I started to do actual whole evenings, like the one we're going to do on Friday with these Broadway songs, where we're going to take apart five songs on Friday night. Probably not more than 15 minutes of music, but for 75 minutes, we're going to, get, we're going to make sure that you hear everything that's great about every single bar of Over the Rainbow, uh, almost like being in love, these wonderful Broadway songs. So that is my answer. I never, ever now just wave my arms and do a concert. I told my manager when I was 29 that I would never again do a concert where I did nothing more than wave my arms. So every concert I've ever done, I've tried to take responsibility for how people listen, whether it's a program like this with the business groups. And last year, I did the Dairy Farmers of America. I did the Turkey and Cook Meats Division of Cargill Inc., the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference. Um, so wherever it is, it's my job to make sure that you get it. And you never have to ask, how do I know what to get across? So I never do a concert, just a pure conductor. But taking responsibility for how people hear you. Self-expression happens out there, not here. Those are two really, really valuable sentences that, that have helped shape me a lot. Anyone else? Chance of, yes, go ahead. Uh, what conductors do you recommend? What conductors do I recommend? You mean other than me? 
Um, no, the greatest conductor by far of all time, and I know this should be subjective, but it isn't subjective, this is the truth, is go on YouTube and watch Carlos Kleiber. Carlos Kleiber is the greatest conductor, in my opinion, who ever lived. And there's a bunch of stuff of it on YouTube. And when you watch it, whatever you think you want to do in business, you'll want to give it up and become a conductor. So I think he's the absolute, Carlos Kleiber is the one to watch. Just fantastic stuff. It's fun to watch Dudamel, too. Um, he's sort of the one who's alive now. Kleiber has died. But Kleiber was fantastic. And Dudamel's fun to watch as well. Um, if you really want to get excited, go on YouTube and see there's a clip of Dudamel conducting these young kids from Venezuela doing symphonic dances. For, the Mambo from West Side Story. It's about the most thrilling thing you will ever see in your life. Search Mambo Dudamel, and it's, it's unbelievably exciting. Uh, anyone else? A question for anyone of any kind? Chance of a lifetime. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, how has your communication style developed over your career? How is, this, is, this is actually, that's a really good question for you. Um, the answer to how my communication style has changed has to do the same way my conducting style changed. And this is really good for you all to hear. You know, when I started, like everyone else, you try to copy mentors. You start conducting like your favorite conductors. You try to look like Clive, or you try to look like Bernstein. You, and my mother's hero was Bernstein. Every room in our house had a portrait of Leonard Bernstein. So you try to copy your mentors. But then what you gradually realize after years of trying, not only did I try to copy them in terms of how I move my arms, but I would listen to their rehearsals, and I would try to talk to the orchestra just like they did. And then I realized after a while, you know, there's a wonderful quote that says, be yourself, everyone else is taken. You know, and you realize that in the end, you should just talk to orchestras and people like you talk to anybody else. And that you don't have to assume an extra, you know, extra personality. It should just be you. And so I finally learned that I should just move the way I move and I should just talk to people the same way. If I were having lunch with you, I would not talk to you any differently than if I was talking on the stage of Carnegie Hall. So I learned that in the end, you know, I'm going to talk about this. I don't think you guys are invited. Are you invited to the listen for the hmm? Is the business... Are you invited for that? That is entirely about that, is finding your own voice, which might not even be the one you think it is. But that's an entire talk that's an answer to your question, is how do you find your own communication style? And the trick is, I really do believe that's it, is that be yourself because everyone else is taken. And I just, it took me about 10 years to realize I could just talk to you and the orchestra and an audience of 2,500 the same way I would talk to anyone else. But finding that, and that's what that whole program uh, is all about. Uh, maybe you have time for one more or two. Yeah, sure. Uh, what would you recommend for people, or conductors, or just people in classical music, to be able to outreach to people that wouldn't normally come to a um, yeah, To people who want to do it, this is what I would recommend. In other words, I spend my entire, I, um, I had this, uh, I was very fortunate when I was in my 20s to have like one of the most famous classical managers in the world. And all he wanted me to be was the music director of a major orchestra because we all have an idea of what you think is success. You know, being CEO of a company or whatever. And I, I remember my very first big gig was conducting at the Kennedy Center, the National Symphony Orchestra. And my manager was so happy. I was 29. I was conducting a big orchestra at the Kennedy Center. And I remember doing the concert and thinking, so this is it? This is what I've been waiting for. I did the concert, audience liked it, orchestra liked it. I was sure by the next day they would have forgotten what it was all about. And so I had to redefine what success was for me. And I had to find out what it meant to me. And at that moment, I told my manager, I said, I never want to actually be the music director of an orchestra. If you want to get rid of me, it's fine. But I never want to do that. And so I'd, that's when I resigned from the manager and I resigned from Yale. And I decided I was going to make music connect with everybody. So every project I do is attempt to connect. I'll just give you four or five. And this is, again, all what the talk on Listen for the Hmm. You all should come to that. It really will answer the stuff directly to you. In fact, I consider this and that two parts of a different thing. Um, but for example, uh, when I first had kids, um, I, really, I really, before I had kids, wasn't even interested in kids. I didn't particularly like them. Um, but then I had kids, and all of a sudden, the world changed. And so I started to take my kids to kids' concerts. And I realized the only thing worse than regular concerts were kids' concerts. Um, but then one day, I was reading my son, Green Eggs and Ham. You know that book, Green Eggs? Which is really a parable about prejudice. Because really, it's a child teaching an adult about prejudice. Try it, try it, and you may. And what's the only thing wrong with the eggs? 
the color, right? Okay. And I suddenly realized, you know, if I could set that to music, millions of kids would walk into a concert hall who would never walk in otherwise because they would know it'd be the only opera libretto they know by heart. Now, at the time, unfortunately, Dr. Seuss didn't allow any composers to ever set their books to music. It was just a form rejection letter. Everybody said, don't bother. Here's a very important message for business people about grit and resilience. Um, everybody said, don't even bother. They have a form rejection letter. So I wrote to them. I said, I'd like to set Green Eggs and Ham to music. No, 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 no. I wrote every week for the next six months. Then I did some research, and I discovered that the lawyer for the Seuss estate knew very well my lawyer, who I had given tennis lessons to. Um, and so I had him call him and say, you know, could we set up a meeting? And then I did some more research, and I discovered that the lawyer's father had been a famous music educator. So I said to him, what is the message of Green Eggs and Ham? Try it, try it, and you may. How can you not let somebody at least try to set this to music? So finally they said, well, we'll let you do it if you can get someone to commission you to write it on spec. You can write it, but we won't guarantee that we'll let you perform it. So I got somebody to do it. I wrote it on spec. I had to sing it for the uh, Seuss's widow and the Seuss estate. And they said, we'll let you do one performance, but it can't be in New York. So we did it out in a gymnasium in, in New Jersey. And every once in a while, you get one of these reviews of a lifetime that says, this is the greatest piece written for kids you know, since Peter and the Wolf, destined to become blah, 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 blah. The next day, Shermer, the biggest publisher, and Boozy and Hawks, the second biggest publishers, offered me publishing contracts. And now Green Eggs and Ham has been the most performed piece of new music in the last half century. But what it is is this wonderful opportunity because when I do it, I talk to the audience about prejudice. And we actually have a conversation about it. So it's not only a way of bringing people in, but it's a way of doing it. Every project I do is that. Right now I'm writing a piece called We Came to America. I'm interviewing intergenerational immigrants throughout the country and creating a piece of music out of their stories. Um, because this is a way of getting people. Um, I did a project. I wrote a symphony for the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and we discovered that that's the largest suicide site in the world. So I went out and I met the coroner who introduced me to families of teenagers had committed suicide. I got to know them really well. They gave me their teenagers' suicide notes, and that became an entire movement of the piece. I also discovered that the land was stolen from Native Americans. I found representatives of their tribes, and I wrote the first movement in their native languages and began the concert with them on stage inviting the audience to their ancestral lands. So every project I do is an attempt to take what we have and connect with someone else. You know, if you think what you're doing is about music, you can only talk to people who are interested in music. If you put it up a level and think what you're doing is talking about listening, you can talk to anyone. I had a horrible end of life experience with my father at a hospital. He went in for a normal, simple operation that was supposed to be one day. Something happened in the operating room. The next moment, we're being asked to do life support decisions. The people at the hospital were handling this so badly, it was like they had no recognition that suddenly we were being asked these incredibly difficult situations. So I decided I would do listening projects, listening programs for residents and interns at hospitals. Remember, I said everything is about listening for possibilities. Everything that happens is a possibility possibility for outreach. And it's our job to connect to anyone. What I say is, if I can't connect to anyone in the world, it's my fault. So everything is outreach, whether it's We Came to America, whether it's the Golden Gate Bridge, whether it's uh, you know that one. Um, I have a new book coming out November 4th. I also wrote the first enhanced e-book on music for the iPad. Um, because suddenly I realized, you know, for 200 years, if you write a book about music, you only have two choices, and they're both bad. One, you can put musical notation in the book and then 95% of the world can't read it. Or you can write about music without notation and then it's like a book about art with no pictures. But then I heard the iPad was invented right around the time of my first book. It wasn't coming out, so I wrote to my publisher and I said, and this is a message again for people in business. I wrote to my publisher and I said, I hear this thing called the iPad is coming out. Wouldn't it be cool if we could put musical notation into a tablet, touch it, it would explode to full screen, you could hear it, and you could put a scroll bar over the music. So it would go in real time, write the comments on the music, and everyone could hear your music and understand what you were saying without having to read a note. That sounds obvious, right? You would think that every business in the world would go, fantastic idea, we're so glad we hired you. They said, we're not really interested. Hardcover books are really what sell big brunt. So they said, no, no, no. So every month when there was a new article on this upcoming iPad, I would send an article around to the publisher, and they would say, no, 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 we're really not interested. We don't know about that. Finally, I got really sick of it. This is another important message. This was about three months before the, um, my book was being published, and the iPad had just come out, and it looked really great. And I said, we have to do this. And they said, we're not interested, we're not interested. So I went out on the web and I said, can somebody give me the email address of the head of iTunes? 
I just put out a random call to every person I knew on the internet. And somebody gave me the head of iTunes, and I wrote him a blind email, and I said, I'm sure you don't know who I am, but I'm writing this book, and I think it would be really cool on your new iPad if we could actually embed these. I just described the project. I said, I don't know if this is even technologically possible or if you would be interested, but if you're not, could you at least tell me if it's possible, or if not, who might I talk to? And I CC'd everyone at the publishing company who had not helped me. Um, <laughs> The next day, I got a response from the head of iTunes, and he said, I don't really know. This is new for us. I don't know if it's possible, but it sounds interesting. I'm going to send it to my team. To me, this was already victory. I CC'd everyone I knew, not only at the publishers. Then six days later, he writes back, and he says, let's do it. And I said, how is it possible that in seven days you got an answer of yes when I've been trying to even get to write to you for my publisher for seven months? He says, our policy at Apple is to come to every decision of yes or no within seven days. And so I wrote what became the very first enhanced ebook for music on the iPad. But that's the sort of messages. It was amazing that people did not see, see, I keep saying back to that phrase, listening for possibility, how they could not have seen the possibility for the publishing industry that this would have opened music publishing books to the entire world who could not read music. But sometimes you just have to push and push and push. So that's my long answer. Everything I do is outreach uh, in some way or another. I have a big project in Istanbul um, on outreach with CEOs there. I go to corporations all over the world. Uh, basically, my mission is to just get what we do out to someone else. But the other key is never believe that you're bringing something to them. That it's not, the, people say outreach, but what they really mean is come to. In other words, we want to stay the same and you come and appreciate our wisdom and our great music. But I say there is no real outreach unless both parties are changed. I spent two years on an Indian reservation writing a symphony about Lewis and Clark. You know about Lewis and Clark? You study that, yes, sort of, yes. And everybody tells Lewis and Clark, like, this is this great heroic story of these white guys. But for Native Americans, it was the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of genocide. So I wrote this piece with a Blackfoot Indian, spent two years on the reservation. My life changed way more. It was not me bringing this great classical music to them. It was me learning the entire life and what community really meant on this Indian reservation. So unless you are willing to be changed, you will never have successful outreach. And maybe that's one more round of applause for our musicians. Thank you. And I hope you'll come on, for, on, on uh, to that. So, listen so for tomorrow the tomorrow night. It's going to be at six o'clock in the Bird Auditorium, which is if you go in the other door for the music school. As soon as you go in there, it's to your right. Make room for my students in my class. They get first seats, but everybody else is invited. Please come. It's more of this. It's going to be really exciting, yeah, I think. It's more of this. And I want to thank you guys again. It was beautiful. And Rob, thank you. My pleasure. Really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.